Welcome to the GIC College of Central Bankers conversation series. I'm Kathleen Stephenson, Vice Chair of the College, and today we will explore the theme of the new BRICS and what does the new geopolitical realignment mean for global growth. We are joined by Alfonso Pratt Guy, a fellow of the college and former president of the Central Bank of Argentina, which he led from 2002 to 2004, during which inflation, in fact, uh, was reduced from 40% to 4%, while at the same time growth uh, held up at 8%. He went then uh, on to um, becoming a member of Congress in 2009, member of Congress in Argentina, that is. And from 2015 to 16, Alfonso became Minister of uh, Treasury and Finance under the Macri administration, during which time he removed all capital controls. Alfonso, welcome to the today's conversation series. Hello, Kathleen. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that uh, introduction. And, and um, um, very, <laughs> very eager to, uh, yeah, the thing with the introduction is that some things stick around, don't they? I mean, with uh, <laughs> the situation now in Argentina, inflation is back a problem. The central bank is, is still against the courts, you know, the ropes and and so forth. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Challenges always, hope. right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's um, what makes uh, the job of an economist that much more exciting, I think. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So today, um, I would like to explore this concept of uh, the new BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And just to remind our audience, originally the term was created in 2001 without South Africa. And it was created by Jim O'Neill, who was then at Goldman Sachs, and who really believed that uh, about this rapidly influ growing influence of these economies on, uh, on the global economy. Now, broadly speaking, we have to remember that this came about at the time when you had massive globalization with China joining the WTO and Russia turning to the West with its energy exports. And since then, the perceived integration with the West has, in fact, dwindled with recent developments and events. And we are now faced with really a realignment of the BRICS in terms of geopolitical allegiance. So, Alfonso, what is your take on this? Well, I mean... Um... My first thought is, just as you mentioned, Kathleen, this, the term was coined in 2001 by Jim O'Neill from Goldman Sachs, but the actual forum was uh, created in 2009, um, and it was, as you rightly said, only brick at the time, and it turned into bricks. It, it uh, gained the final acronym in that, uh, the final letter in that acronym, acronym in uh, 2011 with uh, South Africa joining in. So, but I reinforce what you just said. Uh, BRICS itself is um, is the answer to the end of uh, globalization in the midst of the uh, global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. You know? That's the first thought. Second thought is, I mean, it's. I think it's very important to, 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 to state what BRICS is is actually not. Then we can uh, discuss about what, what what BRICS is. But firstly, we should uh, have a, uh, an agreement on what BRICS is not. I mean, it's not a multilateral organization, and it's not a trade bloc. It's a forum, just like G7 or G20, and a forum that, uh, by definition, um, has been called upon. To, um, to have, a, in the words of Xi Jinping, a new order, a new global order that is more just, equitable, and rational. So essentially is, um, is the way in which uh, China moves ahead, um, reaching uh, their hand to new members, 
uh, that uh, could join in this idea of having a more balanced world, basically. And uh, the idea of new members is actually um, something that um, that is quite um, important at the moment because the BRICS have actually um, presented a formal invitation to six uh, new countries to join. And these uh, six countries uh, will need to uh, to answer that formal invitation by January 1st. So we are only a few weeks uh, um, away from that definition. Argentina, my country, is actually one of the uh, invitees, as is also Egypt, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the United Arab Emirates. So you get the sense of what type of, um, of crew uh, is uh, being asked uh, to join here, including in particular Iran, which is uh, quite an issue. Uh, and also bearing in mind that uh, Russia right now is part of BRICS and is squarely against um, the Western you know, alliances uh, all over the world. So I think um, going back to your point, this was uh, China's reaction to uh, what they thought was an unfair globalized world. It uh, took off in the midst of the global financial crisis, but it's now, uh, my sense is that it's now gone way, way beyond the international financial act architecture. And, uh, and it speaks a lot more about the relationship um, between China and the US, and it's a lot more about geopolitics than about uh, economics or financial uh, institutions. Yeah, and that's a, it's an important point because number one, in terms of this perception of rebalancing um, the influence growth, if you will, um, and therefore trade, um, the implications of this um, realignment, if I may use that um, that word, um, particularly with the invitation of these new countries, does this become more of a political tool and moving really away? And I know that you mentioned this is not a trade block, but we are moving away from um, the trade um, conduits that we've seen over the past a few decades, and we are now essentially um, seeing an architecture that is perhaps more rigid in terms of economic relationship and trade. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, Kathleen, when you look into the um, um, inward uh, trade relationships within uh, BRICS, uh, there's not a lot to uh, call home about, basically, because uh, trade within the uh, forum uh, is not large enough and it's actually not accelerating either. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems to me that the obvious, um, the obvious two dimensions where BRICS is seeking to gain an influence are uh, on the... Uh, discussion of the international financial architecture and i'll explain uh, briefly on that uh, and also on the um probably offering it's more on the financial side offering an alternative to the traditional um, institutions uh, for funding um, through one important um, institution within BRICS that is the New Development Bank. The New Development Bank was founded by uh, the, the founding members with an initial capital of uh, uh, more than 130 billion US dollars. Um, it's been involved in uh, significant projects over the last uh, four or five years, even though they have stalled with the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. Uh, but the loan portfolio right now is around 15 billion, uh, but with uh, loans approved of nearly 100 billion. So it's quite obvious that they want to compete against the traditional channels uh, of lending to developing markets. Um, their sort of um, the pitch there, and I think that pitch makes a lot of sense, is 
we belong to emerging markets, therefore we know better. And secondly, uh, we offer more flexibility than the traditional institutions, uh, and therefore you should look into us. That element is a bit uh, up in the air, I might argue, but uh, but that's that's essentially the case. So basically, you know, competing against the existing international financial institutions uh, is one thing, and the other thing, um, and I want to elaborate on this, Kathleen is reforming the existing uh, financial institutions as, as they are. Because I think they make a very fair point about under-representation, in, particularly in the Bretton Woods uh, institutions. Just to give you a sense, um, if you take the BRICS as a group, they only have 13% of the vote in uh, the IMF and the World Bank. And that compares to um, more than 40% in the case of the G7 countries. And, uh, and here we are talking about countries with a lot more population and more GDP. If you take only, for instance, China and India, they only represent 5% uh, of the vote in these institutions uh, compared to the uh, G7 countries with 40% of the vote. And uh, G7 have only 10% of the world population uh, compared to 40% in the case of China and India, and um, a little bit less than the um, GDP for uh, the BRICS in uh, purchasing power parity calculations. So I think they make a point that they've been underrepresented for a while, that the world has actually changed. This is no longer uh, World War II, uh, it's a lot more complicated than, than, than what it was back then, 70 years ago, uh, or nearly 80 years ago. So they come up with this idea that um, a new order needs to be uh, decided and needs to be discussed. So they've got strong points to make about, for instance, the discussion that is going right now underway in the IMF for increasing the quotas. They want more representation for emerging market and developing countries, and they, war they want more protection, uh, as they claim it, for the voice of the poorest members. But it's not only uh, the IMF. They also want special and differential treatment for developing countries in WTO. And they also have a claim about a comprehensive reform of the United Nations in general, and also the Security Council. You might be aware that both Brazil and China have been, you know, trying to um, to become permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, China, in principle, is happy with that idea, but essentially, what they want is more representation of the, you know, emerging market and developing countries in the existing uh, organization organizations. And I think that that that's a point uh, to be considered, and it's more than fair. That they're making that point. So <clears throat> a couple of points that you, you made, and I'd like to go back in terms of um, this um, underrepresentation, um, and particularly in uh, the um, in the context of reforming the global financial architecture, who's calling the shots here? And particularly with regard to uh, the new uh, the new development bank. It, how is how is that being um, decided? Well, I mean, it's such a good question that it's completely right? completely unclear how they go about deciding these things. Um, I mean, they they've got meetings. They've got their last meeting this year in South Africa, and the next meeting next year. I can't remember where it would be where it will be, mm -hmm. but essentially they've got they've got a a system of deciding by consensus. Uh, but it seems to me that the strategy, the overall strategy is more like China's strategy mm -hmm. and the rest of the countries joining in or not joining in. And in a way that makes sense also because, you know, China represents more than 60% of the group's GDP. If you put together China and India, it's, it's roughly 85% of the group's GDP. One little um, uh, side comment here. Uh, we said before that 
BRICS is neither an international or multilateral organization nor a trade bloc. And the point of comparison would be more like G7 or G20. But nowhere in G7 or any other forum do you see this um, unequal representation, two countries representing 80, 85% of the uh, economic power. So at the end of the day, it's pretty much uh, China's decision. China represents also 70% of, um, of the bloc's trade globally. Mm -hmm. And also China receives around 80% of the bloc's uh, inward foreign direct investment. So there's very little doubt that uh, when it comes to political influence, um, BRICS is, is a lot like China, and BRICS is a bit of a platform for China to make whatever uh, statement and strategy they want to uh, push for for the rest of the world. And um, that, of course, you know, it begs the question, you have India and China, and um, they have not necessarily seen see eye to eye over many different issues. So that could create within the within the group or block, you know, some some friction, if not tension. And the other aspect, I know that you're referring to it as a comparison to the G7 or or, or the G. 20 but to what extent does this give the platform for these <clears throat> countries to kind of reject the economic orthodoxy if you will that has been quote unquote imposed by organizations such as the IMF when crises occur and you need to get back onto um your uh, you know your your footing if you will and and you 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 see that and you juxtapose this potential refusal with the fact that you know at the end of the day capital markets and international capital markets are still very much dominant absolutely absolutely well as we said i mean they they've got a two track approach there they want to uh have a, a, a better say or a larger say within the existing institutions. And until that happens, they've uh, put together these new, this new development bank that uh, will compete to the, uh, against the existing institutions uh, in the meantime. So they're basically catering to the developing countries and to the poor countries um, in a way that could uh, support them uh, with, uh, you know, better, they claim better support than the existing institutions. Um, but well, that claim still needs to be uh, seen in, in practice. You know, uh, we've seen uh, some, some of the lending, part of the lending portfolio of the new development bank within BRICS has had some issues. They've got funding costs that are much higher than, um, than, for instance, the Asian Development Bank or even the World Bank, of course. And, and that's something that is curtailing their uh, influence uh, as a competitor to the uh, existing institutions. Of course, BRICS and the New Development Bank is also kind of the, um, uh, the platform through which China is trying to compete against the US dollar. You know, there is... Right. A lot of concern within that group that uh, trade and financial operations should be delivered in currencies other than the U.S. dollar. So this is another way of, you know, challenging the existing status quo. But going back to the previous uh, uh, question of uh, of the role of China, um, I was I was um, I was shocked by a few polls that I've been looking at. Uh, recently uh, that tell me that, for instance, 67% of Indians, uh, according to this poll, um, are um, are not happy with the idea or are, you know, in, in disagreement with BRICS in general. And 48% of Brazilians, when, when they're asked uh, that same question, uh, think about the US, the former NAFTA, the USMCA, or the European Union, you wouldn't find anything even close to that within 
any one single uh, mem member country of, of the region. So I think if, if China wants to use this as a platform, there's a lot more um, diplomacy and, and work that needs to be done with the other countries in order for that to, to succeed. Well, <clears throat> two things here. One is that um, to, and we'll, I, I'd like to come back to, to the, the dollar, um, but, you know, uh, these polls are being taken presumably at a time when there is much more of a renaissance of the notion of nationalism, isn't there? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that it could skew a little bit, you know, the um, the the outcome of uh, of uh, of those uh, of those surveys. Um, but what I find interesting about the the choices of uh, the countries that are being invited, again, you look in, at Iran, and clearly, it and UAE, it's energy related. You look at Ethiopia and even Egypt, and it is the gateway to Africa, which has been, you know, not so much on the quote unquote West radar screen since for the past few decades. Um, so it's it's almost a belt and road kind of thing rejuggled, if you will, for China, isn't it? Um, and to what extent are the other countries, the other BRICs at the moment, um, happy with that? Uh, or they're just doing the right in a very opportunistic way uh, in order to get more influence. Because at the end of the day, yeah. politics is all, always quite cynical, isn't it? Absolutely. No, it certainly feels that way, Kathleen. And I think opportunistic is the right way of putting it. Um, we could also think about, from a geopolitical point of view, uh, they're also looking for countries that are not uh, squarely aligned alongside with uh, with Europe or uh, with the US, for instance. Uh, the choice of Saudi Arabia is an interesting one because um, just as uh, with India, both countries are very uh, careful not to be seen as too close to one of the two big powers. Right. So uh, it provides India with that uh, uh, capability. I'm not too close to the US because I'm part of BRICS. And we might actually end up doing the same for Saudi Arabia, just to pick one example. Uh, so it serves that purpose from a geopolitical point of view. But but more on the opportunistic side, I think you're, uh, you're spot on in the following sense. I didn't mention this, but uh, when you look into the um, to this share, when you look into the share of strategic um, natural resources. BRICS, as it stands today, already owns 40% of the proven oil reserves in the world, 50% uh, of proven natural gas reserves, 40% of coal reserves, and about 30% of proven lithium reserves. And this is before adding countries like Saudi Arabia, which will you know, obviously change those numbers on the, um, on mm -hmm. the hydrocarbon side. And yeah. even Argentina could change uh, that uh, balance on the lithium side, for instance. So it's quite obvious to me that, you know, under the um, whatever um, surface that they're using on the global platform, there's uh, more than opportunistic. There's a strategic uh, aim here to be the club that eventually will own key strategic uh, natural resources such that they eventually could have a stronger muscle in the rest of the discussions that they would have with the West, basically, and with the rest of the world. Right, right. But it's very important to it's very important uh, to to understand that dimension because we're moving into a different world. Uh, we're also moving into a different world as far as energy is concerned. And um, you take, for instance, China, uh, well, Argentina and uh, Indonesia. Indonesia has not, as of yet, formally been invited to, but I'm sure it will eventually. Uh, those are countries that own a significant portion of the uh, natural resources that will be needed for the energy transition going forward. So, you know, definitely we need to pay attention to that. Yeah, and, you know, in your mind, do you think that 
the West, generally speaking, has been sleeping under the switch, so to speak, that, you know, yeah. there's been not a quick recognition of, you know, this realignment taking place. Of course, it has been. Well, I think, yeah, go ahead. I think the answer to that question is yes, um, but I think it's been sleeping for uh, more than uh, the years that BRICS have been around, I would argue. Uh, mm. You look at the, uh, for instance, the, the U.S. relationship with, uh, obviously with Africa, but even with Latin America, yeah. has been one of uh, complete disengagement. Uh, Europe is more uh, careful about um, about Africa, but uh, but essentially, yes. I mean, and the the precondition for what you're what you're mentioning is that. Both the U.S. And, and Europe in general, of course, uh, have been uh, too um, encapsulated in uh, in the old regime, and uh, they probably uh, not that they've ignored, but they haven't paid enough attention to uh, what was going on uh, outside of the traditional world. Uh, and China took a first mover advantage there, with uh, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, in, in that respect, you, you're talking about the U.S. and Latin America, but, you know, Europe and, and, and Africa, I mean, that's also an extremely difficult relationship. But we see that with uh, um, the disintegration of this, uh, quote unquote, relationship with France and some of the um, some of the old colonies. Same thing with uh, other countries. So it, it, it's been, you know, ongoing since really the end of the colonies. The, the the setup of of a new relationship has been really fraught with a lot of difficulties, um, and Absolutely. and I I would venture to say that they haven't yet been able to to um, uh, get the right platform. In fact, which absolutely, could, and I think yeah. and I think the critical the critical continent where that battle will um, will be played over the next few years is Africa, of course, sure. uh, with the uh, frail political institutions and uh, with the financial needs and uh, China, China by themselves have already made significant inroads into uh, the relationship with different countries in Africa, not through BRICS nor the uh, New Development Bank, but through, you know, the own Chinese banks and the, um, and the own uh, prowess, the financial prowess of the um, Chinese government. Absolutely, are, um, and in fact, even beyond that, no, not just through the uh, People's Bank of China, through the uh, um, Renminbi uh, swap um, operations with central banks, but also actual um, actual loans through the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. That, by the way, some of which are already having some trouble, particularly in Asia, with. Um, you know, lack of repayments and with uh, some losses and some hits that China has had to um, admit um, the the belt and the road around the belt is not going to be uh, it's going to be bumpy and uh, right. they're learning uh, they're learning it the hard way. You see what I mean? You know, before I, I still I'm, I really want to get back to the currency issue, particularly with yeah. the new um, the, the the development bank. But um, before we do that, um, it's interesting that among the countries that are being invited to join the group, um, we, aside from India, other Asian countries don't seem to appear on the map here for the on the list of in invitees. Why is that? I'm thinking particularly Indonesia might be an interesting candidate. But, you know, what is your take on that? I think Ch China believes that um, their backyard, if, if, if you allow me that expression, is, is well served through other initiatives, particularly the Asian Development Bank. Mm. Um, but, uh, but the point is very well made. I think they first want to expand geographically um, and the diversity of the uh, countries that uh, they invite. And um, but sooner or later, um, you'll see more of that going on in, in Asia. By the way, I was looking at my notes and I found that uh, the uh, the poll that I mentioned before yeah. is a poll by the Pew Research Center and was conducted 
in uh, May of this year. So um, uh, sixty-seven percent of Indians that were polled said that they were very unfavorable or somewhat unfavorable uh, with regards to BRICS and and so on. Just for the sake of completeness, completeness. Yeah. No? Yeah. Um, apparently, in thinking about uh, new <clears throat> potential members, this um, there's also. I mean, of course, they need to be invited, but there's a previous round of um, of it's That's informal, it. but it's kind of an application. Countries uh -huh. that show their interest. So next in line uh, after the uh, the six the, the round of six that I mentioned before are Bolivia, Venezuela, Indonesia, Algeria, Congo, uh, Gabon, and Kazakhstan. So it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. More or less the same idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> it's obviously it, it, it's an interesting uh, group. Again, I think natural resources seem to be um, on the radar screen of, uh, you know, the list of invitees, um, uh, you know, and now, of course, you, we have to balance this with the military might that that group versus the West. And, uh, you know, now we're talking potential confrontation that could lead to, um, uh, to, I would say, a relatively disturbing outcome. Um, and I would like to hang on to the notion that this is not a trade group, not a political group um, as such, but you can see the risks going, uh, you know, if this were to become a more cohesive group searching for better representation. And if that doesn't take place, what then? Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that concern. Um, however, having said that, I think it boils, it boils down to, um, to, to China at the end of the day, because China okay. is, the, um, is the main, you know, uh, architect behind this and uh, so far China has been very careful uh, to um, stick their nose into some other people's uh, conflicts uh, and I think uh, you could not argue against the idea that Xi Jinping has uh, has been very peaceful in, in every single step along the way. Uh, of course that could change and always Taiwan is the um, landmark uh, test for for that idea but assuming um, he doesn't fall into that temptation uh, I think we shouldn't be too concerned about uh, the um, the risk that you're mentioning but uh, but of course but the are, quality of yeah, yeah, yeah but there are some you know some regional ones right I mean you've got Russia of course with the Ukraine at the moment and then um, you know the idea of inviting um, Iran um, you know, and you have the UAE as well. So it's, those are, those are, you know, kind of like uh, raising eyebrows in a way, you know, in terms of not so much in terms of natural resources, but really in terms of, you know, this more geopolitical issue. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot, there are a lot more strings and image risks attached to it than, than just the, uh, the names. I mean, I'm thinking about uh, this year's, uh, gathering in in South Africa, and uh, I mean, it looked to me that the South African president was not uh, delighted with uh, the fact that he was receiving Putin uh, at home. Right. So at this particular juncture, right. So uh, yes, I mean that 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 will clearly hang over them until until they they deal with it, and. Um, and I think, but I think it uh, it's entirely up to China to to make uh, that call and to make that PR exercise. Uh, the yeah. flip side is countries that uh, want or do not uh, want to join. It's interesting because uh, you know that Argentina is one of the um, outstanding invitees in this round uh, out of six, and. Uh, of course, the previous administration was already um, very happy to join BRICS, but we had a change in government um, actually a week ago in Argentina, 
mm. and the new administration is uh, is squarely against it. So I think that would be an interesting test, Kathleen, because uh, from a political and uh, from an ideological point of view, uh, the new administration in Argentina will not want to get mingled uh, with um, with this uh, company. But uh, on the other hand, they are uh, trapped for cash and uh, they need the financial assistance of the People Banks of uh, People's Bank of China. Um, so so it's going to be interesting how it um, how it develops mm -hmm. because it might say something about the rest of the group and the and the ones to come. And so that that gives me <clears throat> the opportunity to segue back into you know the currency the um, the, the the development bank. Um, extend these loans in which currency? Well, so far, I mean, that's an excellent question. And um, I mean, the funding currency for the bank uh, is still US dollars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, most of the loans uh, are actually given out in um, in uh, Renminbi, in Juan. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. I mean, we should check a little bit on that. Uh, because it's 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 rather new. Uh, that obviously creates a currency mismatch for the bank itself, but it's yet uh, another um, you know uh, item or another evidence that uh, China is looking uh, all means possible to uh, to increase the um, the uh, participation of 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 Juan in the global uh, financial system you know how they they uh, they were successful in getting the fund to admit a larger share in the sdr um, accountability um, i think what they're doing through the ndb uh, but also through their direct loans to developing countries is uh, is increase the um, the use of the uh, renminbi against the alternatives uh, I think they're they're gaining more um, traction on the financial side than what they're gaining so far on the commercial side, because uh, even if you know the resources are located, as I mentioned before, uh, in in many of the BRICS countries, uh, the trading for commodities and trading for exports and imports is still. Um, greatly done through the US dollar rather than the alternatives. But that's right. obviously, I mean, that's obviously a, a, a key geopolitical interest of not only China, I would argue that every other country within BRICS is very adamant about, uh, you know, uh, having less uh, dependence to the US dollar and a more diversified uh, global financial system. I mean, Brazil is making that point, for instance, Lula, was making that point in the um, in the in their latest meeting, and um, and of course Putin is is very much on board with that one uh, as well. But you know, at the end of the day, it would be very difficult to supplant the dollar, particularly when you look at even China um, and its um, its um, foreign exchange, you know, policy. I mean, it's it's impossible almost, you know, to to. Um, to have a situation whereby it would be a threat, if you will, or or I, would, I should say a strong competitor to the dollar, given you know the uh, um, the capital controls and so on that's prevailed. <clears throat> yeah, but but things happen also, Kathleen. And uh, there was a time when uh, the um, the British pound was uh, ruled over the world, and then yeah. it was not anymore. It was the U.S. dollar. Things yeah. could happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at the uh, the economic influence of the areas that we're talking about, um, I wouldn't rule it out completely. I mean, it seems to me that uh, if uh, you're talking about a group of countries that represent more than one third of um, global GDP, and they've got around 50% of natural resources, and they're very influential trade-wise, and they've got their uh, sort of uh, um, financial um, weapon through the different um, avenues that we discuss. I think, I mean, I wouldn't rule it out completely. I agree with you that uh, that it's difficult, that it will take time, 
but um, but things eventually happen. So uh, just using your expression before, I wouldn't advise um, the Western world to um, fall asleep on the wheel here because uh, these things can, can change. And at the end of the day, money is uh, just the uh, the uh, physical uh, manifestation of uh, of economic power. So uh, so that's essentially what we're talking about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I tell you, uh, 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 Alfonso, we maybe we will have um, the opportunity to um, talk again in a subsequent conversation about that very specific um, uh, topic. I know that time flies. I could go on and on, and uh, I don't want to uh, take too much of your time. But <clears throat> before we we end, I always would like to um, ask uh, uh, the invitee. A more optimistic uh, question, and that is, in the next, let's say, <clears throat> twelve to eighteen months, um, what are the main positive developments that you see worldwide? I think you know. Um, I think the most positive one is that uh, one can claim with a significant degree of um, of confidence that the um the inflation spike that was um, associated with um with the pandemics and with the um policy reaction to the uh to the pandemic is is already behind us i think central banks uh, worldwide have done uh, a pretty good job uh, even more so in the emerging market world than in the uh, developing world so that's that's also an unexpected one Inflation is coming off very quickly, for instance, in Brazil, Mexico, Chile, um, some countries in uh, in Central Europe and Africa. Uh, I think that's critical because it means that um, the economic institutions that have proven uh, elsewhere that provide their citizens with, uh, with progress and, and growth and, and stability are being entrenched in in many areas of the uh, developing world. Um, That means that um, interest rates are probably uh, on the way down. And that's usually uh, very good news for for the rest of the world. Um, So I think that's uh, that's how I see 2024. Big question mark, however, is uh, China again. Not in the sense that we've been talking about during this conversation, but more in terms of the business cycle in China. Uh, It seems to me that Xi Jinping um, does not, I mean, it's it's still evasive for for Xi Jinping to um, to get uh, to get it to to nail it down. I mean, they've been trying to uh, get the transition from an export driven economy to a consumption driven economy. But uh, some imbalances have uh, have actually showed up, like um, like in the real estate sector, and um, and the economy is no longer uh, plowing at uh, eight or seven or even six percent uh, growth rate. So so that means there's a challenge for the authorities there, and um, and growth wise, uh, whatever China does is very important, uh, not just for the uh, developing world but also for the uh, a developed world. So uh, think about, for instance, um, uh, Germany now. They, they've been trapped since the um, uh, Ukrainian war. They had to change tracks. They uh, rely more on China than they used to. So it's a fully integrated world, despite these acronyms that we've been talking about. So uh, we need uh, all you know boats to be rising more or less in line with the tide. And, uh, and the tide it's obviously, um, you know, among other issues, among other countries, but uh, it depends a lot on, on on what China does. So we need Xi Jinping to get it right. Uh, we need the uh, the U.S. elections in 2024 to go as smoothly as possible. Um, you'd be surprised, but um, for instance, 2024 is a year in which more than half of the population living under a democratic regime will go to the to the ballot box to elect new presidential authorities or new premiers more than 50% it's a it's a That's very amazing unusual, statistic. You know. hmm. so 
Of course, yeah. you've got the US and uh, and India. India is is a game turner, a uh, game changer, yeah. if you will. But um, but I mean, it's um, it's a it's a fragile world. Yeah. And uh, there are significant decisions to be made this year. So um, yes, inflation um, is um, is behind us. But there are many other, you know, uh, homeworks where we need to concentrate on and, and dialogue amongst countries and amongst uh, different regions will be critical to um, for the world to get it right. Absolutely. Well, Alfonso, on that note, I want to thank you again. This was a, a wonderful and very interesting conversation. And hopefully you'll join me again in the future <clears throat> discussing this. <clears throat> I certainly hope so. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for uh, having me. And, uh, well, I wish you uh, and whoever listens to this a uh, beautiful holiday, Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. And let's hope for the best in 2024. Definitely. Thank you so much, Alfonso.